session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com, with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. With only two or perhaps three exceptions, every native landlord and every native tenant within the bounds of the six counties were dispossessed and displaced, and although a few of both classes were afterwards permitted to share slightly in the great land spoil, it was only in some other and less attractive localities than their own. Conquest of Ireland by Hill Good day, students. Here we are again at the Hedge Row. We'd like to start our lessons with the 1500s and going then into the Battle of Kinsale and the Flight of the Earls. But first, just a couple of ideas of what happened. Uh, The struggles of Ireland are so often tied in so strongly with the struggles in England. Now, you all know about good old Henry VIII, very famous for all his six wives, who lived from 1491 to 1647. And Henry was a great Catholic who even suppressed, or at least attempted to suppress, a Protestant Reformation that had begun earlier, even before his term as king. He was pushing down the ideas of John Wycliffe, which was a precursor to the Reformation. Henry even went after Martin Luther, and received from Rome the title of Defender of the Faith. But where Henry got in trouble with the church is when Henry's wife, Catherine, the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella from Spain, youngest daughter, wouldn't bear him children, or couldn't bear him children, or a son. She did bear Mary, who is the sister of Elizabeth, and we'll talk about her as we go on. Uh, And Henry wanted an heir and he didn't want to have a woman as uh, the heir to the throne. He needed a son, and so he went through all of his wives searching for one. Henry then broke with Rome, made himself the head of the new church of England, or the Anglican church, and of course wanted control of the parliament and did very well. He wasn't terribly concerned about what was going in Ireland. He did send an army over at a time, but didn't. there was not much of a struggle between them. The struggles came later. After Henry died, of course, Elizabeth becomes queen after she fought with her Catholic sister Mary, and she was a Protestant. And when Mary died and Elizabeth became the queen, she then wanted to enforce the Protestant religion upon the Irish, and she sent a number of people in Ireland to try to keep the Irish down, and we have the beginnings of the Protestant ascendancy, which is also something we will talk about later. But we move into the next century, and we have all of the different characters that are involved. And uh, Michael... You can uh, carry on with some of the great ones, starting with the O'Neills. Well, that's right. I tell you, this uh, uh, Red Hugh O'Neill and uh, Red Hugh O'Donnell and Hugh O'Neill were two of the main characters uh, that featured really in the uh, Battle of Kinsale and the same families for the Flight of the Earls, uh, which we know quite a bit about today. Old Hugh O'Neill had built quite a reputation. He, his father, had been assassinated in some of the intrigue of the court over there in Ireland. And he was uh, really raised by the English after that. And they thought they had an ally there because he came uh, into Ireland and fought uh, against Desmond for the queen. So he did her a great service and he ended up becoming the Earl of Tyrone. And uh, he had set aside the title of the O'Neill, saying that that was rather old fashioned, I believe is the the, uh, way he said it at the time. But it, that didn't last for long. He still had Irish in his blood, so it had all spurn up again. 
but several things had happened. And one thing that happened that the Spanish Armada uh, shipwrecked off the northwest coast of Ireland, and O'Neill took those shipwrecked victims in, and he was ordered to uh, to murder them, to put it frankly, and he didn't do it. And so that brought up a lot of suspicion, saying, well, what's the deal here? Uh, so a lot of the uh, English side of the fence started to think he was a little suspicious and they couldn't trust him. And uh, I think that would prove out later. So that started and they had what they called O'Neill's War or Tyrone's uh, Rebellion. Uh, some call it the Nine Years' War. Some say six, some say eight, but uh, the, the authorities say nine years. And uh, that was quite a battle. And O'Neill came out victorious so many times uh, that he had those people worried because uh, that didn't usually happen. And he had the geography of Ulster in his favor. The lands were just perfect for guerrilla fighting. And what he was known for was luring the troops into positions that he could then attack and be victorious at. And he sure do it, uh, sure did it. And it led up to, uh, it led up really to the battle of Kinsale, which everybody had their hopes on. And that's where uh, the two Hughes, Hugh O'Neill and Red Hugh O'Donnell, uh, joined together. And Red Hugh O'Donnell was uh, uh, his son-in-law, actually. And the two families who had been at odds for so many years, the O'Donnells and the uh, O'Neills, two leading families, united at this point. And the younger Red Hugh O'Donnell, uh, he was always ready to go and ready to fight. And the older uh, Hugh O'Neill, he was a little cagier, and he knew... Uh, he knew how to lead a, a battle that they'd come out victorious in. Uh, Peter, have you heard of the uh, Battle of Kinsale at all? Well, oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, some say that if you want to know what's the problem in Northern Ireland, go back and look at the Battle of Kinsale. And, of course, Kinsale in Ireland is a very beautiful harbor, a very old town, uh, and the, there's a fort there, and they built a kind of it like a star. And they did that in order to protect themselves, but why they could also retreat and yet still see the front line of the castle itself that stuck out, close, It's because some of it's destroyed now, that stuck out into the harbor so that they could all be visible to each other and fire, even from one point of the star, be able to fire across at another point of the star where the enemy may try to be coming in. Well, and if you take a look at some of O'Donnell's and O'Neill's ally, the biggest one mentioned are the Red Shanks, and those were Scottish mercenaries. Now, you take a look at his men, one-third of his men had firearms, and they had very little artillery, which is another reason not to do pitched battle with the forces that they were fighting against. And his plan was to have the old English Catholics that had settled and become more Irish than the Irish themselves in some ways, that they would join with him as well as the Spanish. And uh, since the time of Henry VIII, things had taken on a religious composition, which made people uh, even a more, little more firm in their opposition so here we are moving into the Battle of Kinsale in the fall of 1601. O'Neill's dream came true, and the Spanish army landed at Kinsale, and they brought men and supplies and loaded up the town, and they were prepared for a siege. They were prepared, prepared for the English to come and lay siege to that town, and within seven days the English got there, and they did just that, but it was no surprise to anybody. Now, the English came. I think they had 7,000 men pretty quickly. The Spanish had 3,500 men on hand there, and they fired volleys daily at each other. Uh, not much happened uh, as far as to change the course of a battle, but they were just waiting for the time. Now, what was happening uh, during all this? Well, O'Neill and O'Donnell were going to come down from Ulster because the Spanish chose the furthest most point from them, really, way down south there. So the, the O'Neill and O'Donnell had to bring their two armies all the way down both coasts of Ireland. Uh, uh, I think O'Neill came down on the east and O'Donnell came down in the west coast, and they gathered men as they went. And a couple of the uh, uh, really dis, uh, disenchanted and disaffected uh, Munster nobles had come up there and were staying, and they then came down and rallied more troops as they uh, went. And so finally, they're almost there, they're meeting, and uh, they had come down through Galway, and such a gathering of Irish chieftains hadn't been seen maybe since the time of Brian Baru, I'm not sure, but they were pretty confident they had, uh, they had uh, fate on their hand. This was, this was going to be the 
first time that the Irish broke free completely. And uh, this set it up because uh, O'Donnell and O'Neill then started marching towards Kinsale. And the English were sitting there and they were hurting a little bit. Their uh, horses were just starting to run out of feed. The men were getting tired. They were even thinking about uh, leaving at one point, but they got reinforced with some new troops. Uh, so they're sitting there and they're just, they don't really know what to do. And uh, here comes the beginning of the battle. Now, as that battle shaped up, we want to take a look at uh, who are some of the families that arrived there with O'Donnell, uh, the young, maybe maybe a hot-headed O'Donnell. And that included uh, O'Rourke and Burke and McDermott of Moy Lurg and O'Connor Rowe and O'Kelly and uh, and the chiefs that had been banished from Munster. Uh, one of those was MacMorris of Kerry and also the Knight of the Glen and McMahon and uh, one of the McCarthys. So he had just earlier crossed south into Galway and then crossed the Shannon and waited for uh, 20 days for O'Neill to arrive before they departed. And as O'Neill came down there, he crossed the Boyne and boy, the Boyne is going to play a large part in uh, Irish history later in this century, and uh, he wanted to create some possible diversions so maybe some of those English troops would have to stay uh, in the Midlands of Ireland as he was heading to the south. And when he met up with O'Donnell, like we said, his spirits were high. The whole they all they were thinking that within a month or two they'd be celebrating a great victory that uh, of the kind that Ireland had never seen before. And uh, they basically ended up they had the English covered on two sides. And even the English reported that they were in bad straits, their horses almost done for, and uh, that if they just would have been starved out with sort of a guerrilla tactic, it might have been a completely different story. And from there, the story really unfolded terribly for for the Irish. Uh, O'Neill was a great guerrilla tactician, and he had always lured the enemy into a position and attacked them. It was never a pitched battle. This was different. It would be a standing battle, and O'Neill, it, it, o, O'Donnell, it's believed, spoke for having this fight outright and just do away with the uh, the opposition in a, in a really in a whole different style. And Neil and his men were not used to fighting. Now the Spanish in the town, you know, the Irish right now were just coming down, meeting the forces. The Spanish in the town didn't know that O'Neill and O'Donnell had ar arrived, according to all reports. So they were in the town just doing fine, and they might have heard distant gunfire, but the gunfire was moving away from them. They didn't know that was the Irish being routed. Now, the Irish horsemen, it appears, were not well trained for this type of battle. They really didn't, had never engaged in it before to any extent, and the English horse were very well disciplined, and they knew how to fight, and that would come to play a big role in this battle. Now, in this little so-called skirmish, they thought at first, the Irish outnumbered the English by up to six to one, and that was according to accounts on both sides. And now let's take a look at what happened. The battle largely unfolded right on O'Neill's troops. The Irish horsemen not only did not hold the line or even engage in a, in a true battle with the English, they ended up retreating and they fled right into the Irish infantry which broke the Irish lines. It created quite a bit of havoc. And then a bag of gunpowder exploded by accident because the Irish, I don't think, were that used to handling uh, uh, gunpowder for artillery. Uh, one man fled and then another. And soon it reported that they were running. They were not looking back, throwing their weapons aside. Six flags were captured along with 2,000 arms. Uh, O'Neill, once, once it started, it was all over. They panicked is what it amounted to. Uh, this was not the battle they were expecting. And O'Neill and, and his contention continued to flee with wagons and drowned men left behind as they ran, according to reports of the day. Uh, so that small English force did something there to spook the Irish, and it turned the whole course of the day. And strangely enough, enough uh, O'Donnell shows up after that had happened to uh, O'Neill's troops, and he tried to rally the men uh, according to the writings that we have available, but it just didn't work. Uh, they met later in misery after the retreat. They said O'Donnell could not sleep, and he was screaming at the top of his lungs for three days how this was not the expected outcome. How could this be? 
and it was decided that O'Donnell and a couple of others go to Spain on a waiting ship, and that Spanish ship took no time uh, to visit the Spanish that were locked inside the city. The Spanish actually heard the English victory shots after the battle, thought that was the real battle, started to come out of the city, got repulsed and pushed back into the city, so that just totally did not work at all. But uh, O'Donnell now takes off for Spain to uh, the court of the King of Spain, and he brought with him something called the Book of Invasions, uh, which, by the way, was translated by Michael Clary, who actually translated uh, uh, all those and gathered together all that work for the Annals of the Four Masters. And they're in the shadow of the uh, O'Donnell Castle up there in the north of Ireland. But uh, he took that book, which described a Spanish soldier who came to Ireland and uh, from whom all the Celts and all the Irish are descended, Milesius or Maled, depending on how you translate it. And he went to the Spanish king and said, look at this book. This ancient book of ours tells us that a Spaniard founded our country. We have our blood in your veins. Will you please not give up, give up on us? This was just one battle. And uh, Peter, I think you know something about uh, tying in with Spain there, don't you? Sure do, Michael. Because uh, remember I had spoken earlier about Henry uh, being married to the daughter of the king and queen of Spain. Well, then Henry's daughter, Mary, who uh, succeeded him, and she actually succeeded her brother, Edward, who died as a teenager, and then Mary became queen, and Mary was Catholic. Well, Mary married Philip II, the king of Spain, and the pope then granted to Philip, the king of Spain, the kingship or the title of king of Ireland. But... Uh, Mary died. They never really uh, stayed together, and Mary died, and Philip made no claim to that, and he was engaged in a great war with uh, Mary's half-sister, Elizabeth, and you do have some of the Catholic Protestant fighting going on here, and he had been in war with uh, Elizabeth from 1585, and then his successor in Spain was Philip III, and he supported the Catholic rebels up until this siege of uh, Kinsale in 1601, and it was with uh, at great expense, but with little, uh, very little uh, uh, support. And he, Philip, then offered the kingship to O'Neill and his allies, uh, but O'Neill turned it down. So you have this Spanish, Irish, English confusion, but Sometimes it's all amongst the relatives, all amongst the, 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 uh, the cousins. And then, of course, then the Irish are standing on their own for their own property. And so right after that Battle of uh, Kinsale, uh, Red Hugh O'Donnell goes to Spain, makes that plea to the uh, King of Spain, which Peter has explained some of the connections with the church there and the Pope, uh, trying to get it going. But O'Donnell dies in about a year or so. Some people say he was poisoned. We're not quite sure of that intrigue. Uh, but so O'Donnell dies. That leaves O'Neill on his own. O'Neill fought and negotiated and finally came to a treaty uh, with the crown in 1603. But the terms were just intolerable to him. And I think he had a little advance notice. And in 1607, well, that's when O'Neill fled the... Uh, fled the country, and uh, I think he had advance notice. I th it might have been a gentleman's agreement. I'm not sure, but I read about it in uh, the Conquest of Ireland, and in September of 1607, a French ship departed from Rathmullen in Loch Swilly, and uh, Hugh O'Neill, the Earl of Tyrone, and Rory O'Donnell, the Earl of Tyrconnell, with 90 followers and friends, uh, left. They were bound for Spain, the same place... Uh, uh, Red Hugh O'Donnell had gone, but that didn't work either. The storms forced them to France uh, in October, and they made their way to Rome. O'Neill died in 1616, and one more comment, and it was sort of poetic as I was reading about the uh, departure. As the Englishmen arrived in the castle where they were going to take O'Neill, and of course after this they took him and confiscated, confiscated many lands, they saw an old beaten up wooden harp in the corner that had been left behind and they commented on it so they knew that that harp would have been a symbol of Irish something and it seemed like it had fallen into disuse and uh, it was no use to the Irish king at that time. Uh, they did and they were given 
1607, they were kind of given three options. They could flee with their friends and hope for a reinvasion by Spain. They could go to London, stay at court until grievances were readdressed. We knew where that would go. Or do nothing and live on a reduced income. Sometimes things come down to economics. And so finally we know that they chose the third option, and that was to flee. Well, that's right. And I had one other comment, and that was about uh, one of the ways that O'Neill rose to power, even while he was under the uh, uh, honor, honor bound under the queen. He was funded by the queen to keep 600 soldiers, and that he did, but he rotated his soldiers in and out so he might train 600 one year and a brand new 600 the next year. And so his actual fighting, trained fighting force was much larger than anyone knew. And when time came to uh, re-roof, uh, to put a new roof on his castle at Dungannon, instead of using the lead for uh, the roof, he used it for bullets. So he was planning for a long time to uh, come back up with the Irish. He just knew how to bide his time. You mentioned that the Earls uh, set sail from Rathmullen in the village of Luxwilly in County Donegal. Uh, and, of course, with the followers that they had. But in 1998, there was a lecture given by the Archbishop of Armagh. Remember, Armagh is, once again, it keeps coming up as a very important place in Irish history. But uh, the Cardinal said that uh, the Earl of uh, Tyrone allegedly had a gold cross which contained a relic of the true cross, and this he trailed in the water behind the ship, and it gave some relief from the storm, uh, because there was a, a great storm in the crossing, and they finally reached the continent in, on October of 1607. And they also said the significance of the act underlined by the fact that the date of the exile from Rothmullen was the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. Uh, and they also say that maybe that relic was obtained at Holy Cross Abbey, which they had visited when they were en route to Kinsale, in 1601. Boy, there's so many connections to this story that we just follow up and it gets wider and wider. And it, and it also goes back to what the Irish felt about things, how they, how they, even in the battles, they still were holding on to a sense of religion, their own, against the one that was bringing another. Well, and you know, as this, as this century took place, by the end of this century, the Irish had been crushed. And we're just seeing the first of really three, three confiscations of Irish lands, power, and culture. And this is the, with the flight of the earls. You saw a gigantic confiscation in Ulster. And then, of course, in our, our next segment, we're going to talk a little bit about the Cromwellian settlement. And that was just a savage operation. And then at the very end, you've got uh, James uh, James II coming in and the William Williamite uh, uh, problems. So we're going to cover that later, but we, we thought we'd start off with this first part. And as the Irish culture was collapsing, here you're going to find that for some reason there was a rebirth, maybe a final gasp of Irish literature and recording of history. And you've got uh, several works, but I'll just mention one here and we'll talk about others as we go on in those other segments. But uh, Keating's History of Ireland. Geoffrey Keating recorded his great history in this uh, century, The Annals of the F Ireland by the Four Masters, which I'll speak a little bit on because that was put together in uh, County Donegal uh, about 1632 to 1636, uh, and that was done mainly under the work of Michael O'Cleary. But that's quite a story. There must have been somebody that sensed that things were coming to an end for the Irish uh, sometimes the four people that put this together, the four main people that are recognized, were called the Four Friars. And the annals were at one time referred to as the Annals of Donegal because of where they were put together. Uh, now, there were actually six men who worked on the annals, so perhaps it should be called the Annals of the Six Masters, or maybe even more. You never know all those other little helpers. Uh, but the primary authors of the Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters were the O'Clarys, who were the hereditary historians to the O'Donnells of Turconnell in County Donegal. So that's uh, really one of the best-known histories uh, in Ireland compiled, and it was compiled in the old days in the Irish language. 
it was not translated into the English until the 19th century uh, when really two versions, two major versions of it came out, once by uh, uh, Canellan and one by uh, John O'Donovan. And uh, I think most people who, are, who have studied Irish history will see references to both the Annals of Ireland by the Four Masters and uh, Keating's History of Ireland that I'll talk a little bit more about. Okay, so we looked at uh, the O'Neills, and we're going to find out. The O'Neills were extremely important family, and of course a family from Ulster. We're going to see how the, the Irish are really becoming at greater odds with the English uh, because of religion and because now of uh, other things. The Irish are playing a, another part in this battle in the European element, you know, Spain and England and France. And so these things, as we go step by step in order to discover what's the Irish history, because as I said before, it's it's so much uh, in, intertwined with histories uh, and experiences in England and other uh, countries that were emerging also in the European theater. We're going to go to something uh, in the next segment. Uh, we'll talk about the Confederate Ireland, and I bet that's something a lot of people haven't heard of, uh, and that uh, was what was going on in Ireland while the English were over doing their little battles with each other. And we'll talk about James I of England, we'll talk about Charles I of England, and we'll talk about uh, that fellow, uh, Mr. Cromwell. And so we hope you're enjoying what we're given, and uh, we're still working hard for you. And we'll go into the next segment, and we'll talk to you then. So ends this chapter of Irish History from the Hedgerow. The entire series is available at www.irishroots.com. We have broadcast series on genealogy, song, local history, as well as...